Welcome to another episode of Pod for Good, a podcast where we learn from those doing good in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the world, why they care, what we can do, and most importantly, what you, the listeners, can do. Pod for Good is produced and edited by Random Productions, which is me. So if you like how we sound and maybe what we say and are thinking about starting a podcast, reach out to me. I am easy to find. Pod for Good can be found anywhere you get your podcasts. If you enjoy what we do here, please make sure to subscribe, share this episode on social media, and if you want to, you can give us some money on Patreon or buy me a coffee, whichever one floats your boat. I am your chief philanthropod and class clown for justice, the once and future king, Jesse Ulrich. And I am your vice admiral philanthropod and your class clown for justice. I should have thought of something clever. Um, Chris Miller. <laughs> um, Chris Miller. <laughs> um, Chris Miller. And this episode, we are talking with a Mekanaka transformational speaker coach and therapist. We talked to Omeka about the duality of being a therapist and an inspirational speaker, how to deal with adult procrastination, and he shares his most embarrassing TV moment. Enjoy. We are very excited to have Omeka on the podcast today. Finally, Omeka, how are you today? I'm doing exceptionally well today because the weather here is exceptionally yes. well. And I'm talking to you guys, so I'm doing really good. Like, I'm not a super religious person, but I do seem to notice the weather is always nice for the high holidays for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, <laughs> and then it gets cold right afterwards, no matter when it is, because <laughs> it changes every year. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm always like, this seems to, I honestly tried to remember last year if I ever remember it raining on either of the holidays, and I couldn't. So take that for what's <laughs> worth, America. <laughs> Don't you dare bring that rain yeah. here around Oktoberfest, right? No. Listen, we've had a rainy Oktoberfest. That was unpleasant. So, Oh, very muddy. Oh, I remember that. I got stuck. <laughs> oh, I got... I shouldn't laugh at that. That's weird, terrible. Quick story. A couple years ago, was that Oktoberfest? And just that, it was like really muddy. Mm-hmm. And if no, if if you're listening, have never been to Oktoberfest, it's one of the events where there's like a million people there. All of Tulsa's there. And so I get stuck, not only in some mud, but like a, a carpet gets caught up on my chair and I'm like just spinning out with all these people and all the, you know, the good of people. All of a sudden, I just see a guy like, hey, you know, he gets everyone's attention. <laughs> Everyone turns their like phone lights on. These four or five guys are like picking up my chair, pulling out the carpet. And it just was like, yo, this is super awesome. I got all this support. <laughs> yeah. And from then, like, I, I love going to Oktoberfest. I love the same people. I, I, I kind of hope that story was going where everyone, everyone was so drunk. They thought you were like trying to dance in your chair. And like, they started like clapping along. Yeah. <laughs> it all yeah. Me up. <laughs> um, no, if I, had a, if I had a lighter chair, I would totally yeah. do that. Funny story about a Mecca's chair, just real quickly. You know, so Mecca was in my Thrive class with me. And there was one of our many, many sessions. I think it was during our retreat, actually. We were covering a really, really serious topic. And just like at that moment, Emeka decided to sort of change his angle just like as quietly as he thought he could. But I was right next to him. And it just, I could not stop laughing because it was such a, the room was so quiet and you just heard his chair move just a little bit every couple seconds. And for some reason at that moment, I found that hilarious. Bro, that happens so much. And there are times I'm like, just hold it like so. I so for those that don't know, I am in a wheelchair. I am a quadriplegic, and I use a motorized wheelchair. And this clicking sound—I don't know if you can hear the clicking sound—that happens every time I move my chair. Sometimes I'll need to uh, adjust and lean back, and it just goes into this. Just I'll try and see if you can hear it, but all the motors running just make it to where I can't. I can't sneak around anywhere. <laughs> yeah. And it makes it especially hard when there is somber yeah. moments and it's now between me and like, okay, I got to move. All right, let's see anyone. No one will notice. Don't and like, know. yeah. And I see everyone looking. And I, it, I, it was just, it's, it, it's sort of that weird thing that happens when you're trying to be serious and you're holding it in. And then something outside of that happens and you just, your brain just like, well, you're going to laugh hysterically now for five minutes. And <laughs> Well, someone was talking about, I don't know, childhood poverty or something very serious, and I'm just losing it. Okay, um, this podcast and our original goal, I feel like aligns very well with like pretty much your entire, like every minute of your day, because you are, you are out there, you're working with kids, you are a public speaker, and you know, 
I have yet to like, no one comes away from a thing where you speak at ever, not like super hopeful about whatever they're doing next. And I'm, I'm always amazed by that. Cause like inspiring people is not a natural skill. Most people have. How do you, I know that, you know, preparing to, to speak or preparing to work with kids is both of them are challenging in two different ways. Do you like, oh, yeah. do you have to like psych yourself up for those things? Man. So it's weird as, as I can't answer that question without giving some context that like, so I was injured in a football accident and I went through a very dark time after that, you know, um, the months after my accident, I could not really plan what my life would be like because I didn't know. I had no idea what tomorrow even looked like, you know? And so I'm adjusting to my body and adjusting to the world and going through that stage in that season and coming out of it. When I came, I'll say this coming out of it kind of recharged a battery for me because it gave me a, a new perspective on how I would approach my life. And so now as I like, I don't necessarily need a lot of psych up because it's like I've kind of shifted how my battery works. And so my battery kind of thrives off of just how do I help? How do I do good? And how do I, you know, make sure that I am good for people around me? You know, it's not that I'm going to always have great days or great attitudes or anything like that. But as long as that I'm, I try to not be a net negative to the world. So it's, and that's very simple. It's like, to me, it's just not using a moment to not take out my own frustrations on someone that doesn't deserve it. And so sometimes the day is just that. It's like, maybe it's not, maybe my bad day is not necessarily psyching myself up to bring good. It is more so, you know, managing myself to not bring bad. And so when it comes to the stage, I got to know, I got to know myself a lot when I was in that, you know, season of obscurity and one of my, you know, my personality, I have a big personality. I have a personality that i you know, I just like, I get my energy from being around people. And so when I am on stage, what's funny is that people are terrified of public speaking. Like I talk to people all the time. They're like, I could never do that. And whenever I get on stage, I always have butterflies before I start. But once I get the roll in, I start to feel like, okay, like, I'm just talking to one table, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I, I just put myself at someone's table. I'm just having a conversation. I generally start, start to get psyched up and energized. And yeah, this is really, it's, it's, it's that part. I think speaking is fun for me. Counseling and therapy on the other hand is that's something sometimes I got to get psyched up for because you are like as a therapist is like, you're kind of taking in like a lot of dark, you know, dark stuff. You know what I mean? And, um, I usually say this, I'm like, when I, as a speaker, it's been interesting, this journey that I've been on, because as a speaker, my responsibility is to bring light and shine light from the stage. As a therapist, my responsibility is to sit in the person's dark that's across from me and be comfortable with that. And that presents its own challenge because for me to be able to be comfortable in someone else's dark means I have to be comfortable in my dark. And sometimes that in itself has been my own challenge because it's like, you know, I got out of the dark and I don't want to go back there, you know, and to be a good therapist, you have to, you know, empathize and you have to kind of meet your clients where they're at. And so sometimes the struggle there is, is like, you know, you hear someone share a really tough thing about, their childhood or their background. And so now in order to be there with that person is like, okay, now I've got to tap into that. And I'm just me as a person It's sometimes hard for me to go there instantly. It makes for its own unique challenge that I have sometimes, especially like, for example, on Saturday, on Wednesday, I'll be going to, I have a speaking engagement on Wednesday. And when I come back, I'm going to come back with like all this high energy but I'm going to have to kind of adjust gears whenever I start to see some of my clients Wednesday evening. And it's not that I won't come in feeling super good, but it's just that I have to be ready to not cover up someone's like dark, you know, shine a light on someone's dark when it's like, okay, no, I can't just be Mr. Positive 
like in this moment, if you bring in something that is not so positive, you know, that's been interesting. That's been an interesting thing over the last two, three years. So how do you kind of, I guess, go the opposite direction, sort of recover from those therapy sessions to get back in sort of that hype mode you need for when you're doing the public speaking? Man, some days are extremely draining. I will go like, usually for me, my, what I do for a recharge is I can work out. I can shut, shut it down to where I just kind of binge a show, watch sports, get a good night's rest. And then I start the next day, just like, all right, we are like, we start over. It don't really take, it doesn't take me a long time to recharge my battery because I typically fit in small, like mini boosts throughout my day. Like whether it is hanging out with my friends, having like deep conversations, those are things that fill me. And so I know that, you know, I could go, if I were sitting, working as a therapist all week long or whatnot, by Fridays, by the time Friday gets there, I'm, I'm tired and I'm not tired to where I don't want to be out. I'm just, tired to where I want to be out, but it'd be out for me. I want to, I want to go to a restaurant, watch a game, get some food, get a beer and not think about work. And so that, that is how, like, just, that's one of the ways, but other ways, you know, uh, there are times where I'm, I'm listening to an audiobook and I'll listen to audiobooks a lot. And some days it's like my brain cannot take in, you know, what I'm listening to. So I just need to play some music while my windows down, play some music. Instead of taking the fast way to a location, I'll take the long way just to, you know, just the wind in my hair and singing whatever song comes to mind. If it's Backstreet Boys, if it's, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever comes to mind. Were you interested in counseling before your accident or was this a post-accident? Absolutely not. Okay. Definitely a post-accident thing, but it's one of those things where it's like, um, I, I'm, I was built for it. I didn't, and I didn't, you know, you, there's certain things you grow up with that, you know, we don't really recognize what our strengths are when we're kids because those things are framed very differently, you know? So growing up, I always was someone that, you know, liked to help other people. I, when I was in eighth grade, I would talk to the seventh graders. When I was in ninth grade, I talked to eighth grade. Like I was always looking backwards to kind of show someone behind me the ropes. Um, and then I was always a class like clown. I, you know what I got when I was a kid, I always got in trouble for talking. And as an adult, I get paid for talking, you know, it's a, it's a crazy. And that's that lesson for me <laughs> is what I use with the kids that I work with now, because I'm like, yo, I just recognize your superpower in its unrefined in it's un, unrefined form. It's just raw right now. So you're, you know, X-Men, you know, all X-Men, when they found out their superpowers, they, you know, they were raw and they destroyed everything around them. And then it just took them, you know, meeting that Professor X and then honing that thing in. And now they saved the world with what used to call destruction. For me, I used to always have this knack for people. I think my time that I spent in Nigeria helped me a lot too, because that I lived in Nigeria for about a two and a half year span when I was 13, came back when I was 15. And that experience kind of opened my worldview a lot. Because, you know, coming back to America really changed me. And I got to see that everything that I have here, I'm t I take for granted, you know. But living there and going there by myself and learning how to interact with a new culture and people that I did not know prior and just, you know, being put into that fire. And I came back, I, you know, for me, it was like, okay, I can pretty much make friends with anybody. And... After my accident, it really, I had no idea what I was going to do in my life. As I stated earlier, I just so happened to be, I went with a friend of mine to his church to volunteer at his uh, asking, and it just happened to be kids. And when I would talk to them and feel like, oh, you know what? I don't, I don't look down on kids. Like I, I think that we all, like they all have something to offer. I think at that moment, they taught me a lot um, when I was in this position where they put me there to teach them. Here I am learning from kids. And so I've always maintained this like relationship with young people where it's like, yeah, you know, you could talk to me. I'll talk to you as an adult. And because I do believe that you have a lot to offer. And they, I've always been able to 
you know, build bridges toward, you know, them, others. And so soon after my volunteering at this uh, youth group, one of the parents and some of the kids would say like, oh, you'd be a great like counselor. And I never even thought about it. So then I ended up uh, at a school, at a college, trying to speak. And when I was leaving, the professor asking me like, hey, like, what do you have? What are your plans for school? And at that time, I had no plans. And he he invited me to come back to the school, to enroll in the school. Uh, He offered me a scholarship for my first year. He said I'd be good for the program. And the program was rehabilitation counseling. And so I basically in this moment where I had nothing, I just said yes. And that set me down a path that, you know, got me to this point where I am now. And it's weird because I don't know what else I'd be doing. You know, I with especially with speaking, I don't know what else I don't know what else I'd be doing if it wasn't something with young people or using my voice or my personality because for a long time, I thought it was going to be my, my physique, my brawn, my strength. And once that was taken away from me, it was like, okay, well, I still got my brain and I still got things that, you know, inherently make me me versus uh, me thinking that me, who I am is tied to my physical ability, you know? Uh, I mean, podcasting didn't exist when Chris and I were in high school, but Chris, if we were told when we got in trouble for speaking in class, that like we should go into radio, I feel like our lives would have been different. <laughs> Maybe. Instead of just them, instead, I think so. I think so. I know. Um, we need to get yeah. uh, Emeka one of the our shirts. They say "Class Clowns for Justice." So yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Oh, I'm sure I, out of rock. The yeah, head out of that I, I was gonna I was gonna bring you one when I was over at your house earlier this week, but I forgot as per usual because I'm terrible with marketing. Pop for good. Um, one of the lessons of this. Um, Mm -hmm. pay someone else to do it. Uh, (laughs) so Mecca, the first time I was introduced to you was actually when you were a United Way ambassador. So that's what eight years ago now, seven years ago, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Seven. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Seven. Yeah. Well, while ago, but I mean, even then you could tell, I know that was fairly early on in your speaking engagements, but you were always really good at, uh, making the conversations more intimate less like somebody giving a speech at you, which I appreciated. But part of that, it was all about, you know, your story, right? What what your story meant. So how how do you continue to hold on to your own sort of personal identity when in some ways your story is out there and bigger than you? Yeah, that's a great question. A, lo- a lot of times what I, the way I I think for me, there are times like my story from like in a nutshell, it's the, like everybody else, I, you know, going to go to college, get a life, but my life went off track, suffered a spinal cord injury. And now I'm a wheelchair user. Like my story is what it is. And so I think that there are times when I'm speaking to different groups, I try to think through and identify different things about my story, different, different feelings about it and different, you know, and that sometimes can be hard because if I'm an autopilot, then I can just give facts. When I started thinking about feelings and started to think of like that was when things can get a little bit hairy because I'm like, whew, man, that's, that was a dark, hard time or whatnot. And I'll try to think about different stories that my brain, like I, that I've forgotten just to remind myself of like a time that I didn't, and just remind myself of different things that I, you know, that I've forgotten. So it's usually, it's trying to, my story to different groups and find different gems that I, you know, sometimes have forgotten. Um, and it's, you know, speaking is very, is very interesting because uh, it's interesting because my story is now the anchor, like it's the anchor. Like, so you're going to, you're going to hear me, you know, you're, I got it. Cause I, even if I get up and talk, I could go into a room and not mention my injury at all. I think I use my injury as an anchor for people to know that like, yo, I've been through some dark stuff. And so here I am as a person that is talking to you from someone that has been in the valley, been to a mountaintop, been back at a valley. And I just try to help navigate that journey between, you know, life sucking and life thriving and things like that. And I, like, like I said earlier, you, you said that, or like you said that it, 
I can make it intimate. I think that there are times where I'm on stage and again, like, like I look at a table and I'm just like, just in my mind, I'm sitting right there. I have, there are times where I'll be sitting in a room. I've been in a room of a thousand people. Someone sneezed in the middle of my speech. Like, bless you. I'm like, all right, let me get back to where I was doing. <laughs> and so, I don't know. This is, I, I just kind of, I, I just try not to think of myself as anybody bigger than anyone. You know, I, do, I just try to really maintain, like, even as someone that you're brought to speak, I am no different than anybody else that's here. And I think that helps me a lot. I'm curious, since you since you get to do a lot of different kinds of speaking engagements, I'm curious what's the most interesting group or most interesting situation where you've gotten to do public speaking. So United Way was a very interesting job. It was, I would say that my work with the United Way was, those were some of my favorite, that absolutely hands down, I think was my favorite like job because they put me in so many different positions. You think that speaking is just one thing. It's like, all right, you're going to show up and say the same thing at all these different events. And it is not, it is, especially when I'm, as someone like me, I don't come in with like a canned thing. I, some people will ask me like, how do I prepare? And it's like, there's only so much that I can do to prepare because every room is different. And so I might have like, <laughs> I might have a thing planned, come into the room and it feel like, uh, this may, you know, this don't feel like what I was going to say. And I learned this because of United Way. So with my role at the United Way, I was responsible for going and basically fundraising and speaking to companies day in, day out. And so I would show up to a, let's say I show up to a nonprofit and I'm talking to the nonprofit workers and volunteers. And there are some jokes that I would say that, you know, you get people laughing, you get people crying. And for me, if I can get you to experience that range of emotions that I, I am doing, this is, this is a win. Experience the highs, the lows, and then tie it in with what my purpose for being here is, it's a win. I would then leave there and then go to, say, a engineering company. And now I'm talking to all the guys that are out on the rigs. And I would recognize that some of these jokes don't work for blue collar like workers. Like they, they're just, they are hard hats. What, so there is funny because it's like if there are women in the crowd, some jokes would, you know, girls would laugh and then it let the guys feel comfortable to laugh. So if I go in and I see it's all men and it's all blue chip workers, then I kind of, I would kind of settle in on more of the facts. And I could go, I could go down a certain path, but you know, men are, are harder to be vulnerable than a group of women. And so I would, you know, with them, that were, those were certain situations that I felt like were funny because I, I could, to this day, I remember the, I was at a, I was at a company and they had me there all day. So they just cycle in different workers and again, one group bunch of women talked great having fun they come up to me after oh my gosh you're so inspiring i'm gonna increase my check and then the next group bunch of men i went with the same thing same cadences and it felt like they're just looking at me not a like even with, with a good joke no one even cracked a smile and i'm like mm, all right and then i got to the end and it's like Whew, that was a tough crowd. And like, so situations like that have been interesting. The ones with kids, kids are always fun because they ask the craziest questions. Um, and I can tell you that working with young people is what really refined me as a human being because in this time of my life where I was really self-conscious and really insecure about my phys physical body, um, it was being around kids that really toughened me up because they will ask you any question that comes to mind. And so there was one, I was talking to a group of Boy Scouts, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. And I remember just talking about how I was self-conscious about my wrists because my wrists are really tiny or because the atrophy of my muscles. And a friend of mine telling me like, man, like a, no one is looking at your wrist. 
no one cares. Like they just see Mecca. All right, cool. Get done talking to the group of kids. And the first question, sir, why are your shoulders and your biceps so big, but your the rest of your arms so small? And I was like, <laughs> Uh, all right my name is mecca good night y'all i'm done i'm done like, like i'm over this but they oh my goodness they would ask me so many random questions like how do you pee how do you poop why do you use that chair do you did you like football would you go back and play football um you know when do you fart like you know just crazy <laughs> random questions like so those ones are always interesting because i never know what's gonna what's gonna happen I got, I got done speaking at a school and in, this is how I'll tell you this wide range of questions. One kid in a middle school stood up. It's probably one of the best questions I've been asked, but a kid in the middle school asked me if you had the power to see the future and see the future or go back to the past and change the things, would you, you know, what would you do? Would you go rather go to the future and see some things or go back to the past and change some things? And it had me stuck on stage like, yo, someone check this person's ID. Like, what, what kind of middle school is asking that kind of, like, question? And so called Mel Guard. I was like, you know what? I got to think about that. And the very next question, same middle school, same class. Sorry. Next question. What's your favorite Pokemon? <laughs> <laughs> I can answer that one. Like, all right. Well, it was Charizard. <laughs> Listen, the past future question is always easier for me. It's like past, kill Hitler, move on. <laughs> Next question. There you go, see. There, there you go. Uh, someone, I posted it on my, on my social media and I remember someone said, if I had, if I could answer that question, I would have said, I would have gone back five minutes just so I could ask them the question. Yeah. Before oh, the question. yeah. <laughs> Talk about some insane. Yeah, that's great. But people, I think you have to do public speaking a lot to understand that most of the time you're in a situation where one, you can't actually see that many people that you're talking to Two, We mm -hmm. all, even professionals get nervous talking in front of people. And three, we all talk faster than we think, than we should <laughs> when we're talking in front of people. Right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as a fast talker already, that was my <laughs> hardest challenge. I'm like, all right, I really got to dial this down. I gotta, I gotta sound ridiculous to myself so that other people can understand what I'm saying. Man, there, I've done certain things where I've done different things where it's like you have to give a speech within a certain amount of time, um, like a, like a, like a disrupt, uh, where we had the five minutes and you think that five minutes is a short time. And then you start to talk and then you got, you're done with everything you're saying in three minutes. Like, wait a minute. And then when you're given, when I'm given a long time, I end up talking for, you know, 60 minutes. I'm like, what is <laughs> happening? How do I, how do I fit, gauge this yeah, thing? Like, it's just like how making, it's like brain. how making short podcasts is much harder than making long podcasts. Like trying to get everything you want to say into a short time period is actually much harder than just having space. That's a good, so that brings me to my question. How long are the podcasts usually? Ugh. Um, they're usually like 45 minutes to an hour and I try to make them once they're done, like in the 40 to 45 minute range. Um, but our conversations are so windy that it's very hard to just cut out a section because usually that section somehow relates to something else we talked about either after or before. And so it's like, yeah. it's like trying to edit a stream of consciousness novel sometimes. <laughs> it's like, this is like James Joyce in podcast form for our literary friends out there. <laughs> or maybe Kafka, perhaps. Yeah. 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 Not the horn moment. <laughs> the, one, the one thing I don't like about Riverside FM is it makes it very difficult for me to play the air horn. So I just, I will insert it. So I guess like as someone who is sort of brought in to inspire and someone who spends their time trying to, you know, deal in, in the darkness that is teenagehood and, you know, preteenness. When you're not doing those things, the, the, this isn't our normal, like, what do you do for fun question, but it's kind of when it's just you and you have free time and like, you don't actually want to be with other people. What do you end up doing? Man, that's a great question. Like I've recently have been trying to figure me out right now because they're in this stage of my 
right now for this this current Omeka is probably one that has the least grasp on who I am only because there there's always something that I'm working toward that kind of comes in like all right I was working toward my speaking career working toward my counseling working toward like building you know this life and you know I've accomplished a lot of different things and so I'm trying to figure out who that person is I was literally just really reading a book today called no bad parts and I'm going through this exercise where it's just like quieting down and just kind of analyze and see like what's there who's there so when I'm not really wanting to be around people man I kind of just sit like to be honest I get like if it's if it's a and that's no pun intended but <laughs> I if I um I just kind of sit and, and I could read listen to a podcast um but I again I like taking strolls and just I think, but I don't think it's weird because I don't, I wish that I thought more, but I don't, that sounds weird. I'm, I'm not trying to say that I'm dumb guys. No, like think, you need to turn your brain off sometimes. I, I get that a hundred percent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I, I want to think more because I think for me, I get engaged in what it is presently that I'm doing that I don't reflect enough. That's the word I'm trying to say. I want to reflect more. Um, I'd love, that's like reason why, you know, finding different avenues to um, not necessarily create content, but record self. Um, I want to be more, I want to do more writing. I want to do more recording just to kind of get some of what's happening around me out and onto something, some medium um, so that I can go back and reflect and see like, okay, this is what, this is who you felt like you were at this moment. Um, these are, this is ways that you've changed. And um yeah, I, so I want to reflect more. But again, to ask your question about who is there when I'm not doing anything else, man, I'm pretty much just chill. Like I, it's that's yeah. I don't really do much of anything. I if it's if it's nothing to do, then my nothing will turn into like all right, maybe call a friend, uh, go outside. I can really just not do anything. I don't have a wife or kids to tend with. <laughs> or a dog to tend with in those moments. So it's weird. It's like, not weird, but it's like interesting for me because I think about my friends that do have all of these things. Like, you know, tend, a lot of my friends right now are, are tending to babies. And I'm like, yo, what would my life look like if I just had, or just constantly busy? Because right now I've got thousands of kids, but I give yeah. them back. <laughs> like I can leave yeah. them. Like, and recharge what if what what can i do for the person that cannot um, they, yeah and also i will pray this something that i did realize even speaking to, on that note i will say that i do have this um need that i, I always want to i want to fill fulfill needs um and so i'm i consider myself to be someone that will show up if you were to randomly call me and be like i need you know i'm moving um I would instantly ask, do you have enough space to move stuff? Because my van has space. So I, I enjoy meeting needs and I don't know whether that is tied to, I'm exploring what that's tied to because it's not just some altruistic, like, oh, I just like doing good for other people. I'm sure it's tied to some other thing. Like I, I'm, I'm really in a space right now where I want to figure out who I am and why I am. Um, and so that's taking some time right now to really think. So Jesse, you're that way as well. But what does it mean for you that you always want to uh, fulfill needs for everyone else? <laughs> I mean, it's, <laughs> it's hard. Cause like when you're, and I spent a lot of my time alone in my house, uh, you know, working and, you know, having, you know, ADHD means that sometimes I will zone out for ADHD reasons. And sometimes I will zone out for emotional reasons. And that's just how my brain resets itself. I've learned that the second one I mentioned, the recharging sort of zoning out, is actually just like a form of meditation, really. It's just I'm doing it in a sort of not official sort of way. But when I do actually like attempt to meditate and just like sit quietly for five minutes, it actually ends up being incredibly useful and um, satisfying way to 
you know, especially if I'm stressed out about something, like I just need to like, I, sometimes I realize I need to get up from my desk and go sit in another room or go outside and just like look at, at the world. I could walk now because it's not ridiculously hot. Um, but yeah, sometimes you need to like tr- force yourself to not think about the things you've been thinking about all day long and just be. Are you a procrastinator? <sighs> yes and no. I used to be a much worse procrastinator. Um, it's hard to be a procrastinator when you work for yourself because <laughs> you literally like there's no one there's no one to shift blame to there's no one to be waiting on uh You'd be surprised i work for myself and that's I, I, I mean listen pretty, i do too i think that's what i do when i'm not doing anything i'm yeah. procrastinating well, I'm actively and creatively procrastinating. i've learned mm-hmm. that procrastination serves purposes right and so like what i try to do is useful procrastination where if i'm not going to do something i'm going to think about one why i'm not doing it yet and two how do i make it better when i do start doing it mm-hmm. so Instead of just being like, I'm, I am stealing yeah. that. Like instead of say playing a video game, which sometimes I also do to take a break from things, I'm my brain is always wanting to think about two things at once. And so, how do you make that useful to yourself? Mm. So, for, for me, I certain things I need to feel pressure before I can do them well. So I often mm, procrastinate until I have enough uh, pressure built up, and then I can jump in and do them more successfully, which may just be an excuse I've made up for procrastinating, but it seems to work for me. Everyone, every, That's, yeah. I just wish I could just bottle it up and take a shot of it every time I need to do something like, all right, let's, let's yeah. get this, let's get this energy. Yeah. Going. Well, like, yeah. I, I think we all, we've all, we, there are all things that we've learned that we can succeed in while still procrastinating and things that we can't succeed in while procrastinating. And I've learned when I can procrastinate when I can't. And so I've just like, learned how to handle the things where if I put it on to like, like say take video editing, for example, right? If I owe a client a draft of a video and I said, I'm, I'm going to give it to them on this date at this time. And it's two hours before, and I haven't even looked at it. It's not going to get done in time. Something is going to go wrong. There's going to be a problem I can't fix. So I at least have to give myself one full extra day. Like I'm, I now feel stressed the day before. So I just <laughs> sort of moved the procrastinating marker in my life. I literally told my, so I told my job because I get, I get behind on notes because after every kid you see, you got to do notes, you got to do paperwork, got to do different meetings and stuff. And I told my job like, yo, like I'm, I mean this when I say this, you guys are going to have to lie to me. Like, (laughs) don't tell me if you want something in, don't tell me when I need to have it in. Lie to me. And literally today I get a, a, I got a message that was like, Hey, I need to set up this meeting. What's your week look like? I'm like, all right, let me look. I tried to schedule it for Thursday and they're like, okay, um, what about next week? And I'm like, okay, is it, does it need to be this week? But I got it scheduled and I recognize, I was like, oh, they're listening to me <laughs> because this thing doesn't need to be done. And like, it's a three week thing, but they're like, we're going to start right now <laughs> so that I can go ahead and start planning it and getting it done. I'm like, that is what I need. Like I'm, I, I just realized yesterday that like, you know, I, I've set up a Calendly so people can like make times to meet with me and certain clients can set recording times. And I realized I never actually marked off days when people can't schedule at all, just so I have days to like work on things here. And most of the time it's not a problem. And then I, I'll get super busy and realize I've given myself no time to actually do the work because I'm working on other things. So I'm like, all right, I need to figure out what days I can block off completely just in case. Like, even if I don't have work to do, there are still things I could learn or do. I could go through my email box, clean my office. There's, I got plenty of things to do, right? But thinking that far ahead is not something my brain naturally does. So <laughs> again, we're getting deep. We're getting deep into yeah. the inner processing of how this podcast works for sure. Um, I mean, I'm happy. I'm happy if Chris and I record an intro for an episode that's going to be released on a Thursday on Monday of that week. Cause that gives me Tuesday and Wednesday to finish editing it. Um, sometimes we've done it on Wednesday and I've, at that point I'm editing the episode ahead of time so that I can just throw it all together. But it's, you know, just like with writing papers, I was not one in college who could wait till the night before and write a paper. Cause it would be garbage. That's <laughs> not how my brain works. My brain has to go through something multiple times. So it's funny you bring up college. Cause oftentimes I think to myself, I got a master's degree. <laughs> Like I did all of that rigorous work. Like I, I look back at that person. I look at pictures of my graduation and I'm like, 
who is that guy? <laughs> like, because I don't know if I could do the same thing present form. Like, and I thought I I do think some I have aspirations to go back to school under the right circumstances, but man, I'm like, just actually. I know the reason why I want to go back to school, just so I can figure out if that beast is still inside. <laughs> you know, I just want to know, hey, is, is he still there? Like, he's, he's lying dormant. Because I'm like, yo, papers, 10-page papers, like classes every week. Like, man. I mean, I think that's why a lot of PhD people end up not finishing it, because even a master's degree has more of a structure than your PhD program does, especially in the social sciences, where you're given funding for less less than the time amount you'll need to actually complete the thing. And so, first of all, you're stressing out about that for five years. And then, um, you know for a fact, you will not have both the financial and class structure to finish your thing. It's all on you. And we're terrible. I think human beings are terrible at that, like forcing structure on ourselves versus having structure put on us by others. I agree. I think that I want to go back to school for a PhD, so I'm thinking about a PhD in organizational community mm. leadership. I've decided that I will do the mental toll. I'll take on the mental toll if the school will take on the financial one. I don't want, I don't want both. <laughs> like, yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't want yeah. both. So, man, yeah, I get those. I think that that's why I really enjoy, like I hated school growing up, but I liked learning. And I also needed the structure because without the structure, it just... Like it's, I don't know. I, I need, I need the structure. The structure kind of helped me. Um, and so there are times where I miss the intake of information, even if it was like drinking water from a, like a fire hydrant or whatnot. Um, I miss that. And it's, I, I can't recreate that on my own, you know, like, so I, I, my listening to books or podcasts is a way that I do it, but it's like during that time, it was like, you'd have to read. I'm reading five or six articles in a week and, you know, writing and having to look up how, if my writing style is correct and go back to the textbook. Like there's so much information and I miss having, I miss, I miss feeling that smart. <laughs> I mean, uh, Chris, you'll appreciate this because you, you, you get, you get a lot of my complaints about sound issues and again, like skill, things that I was interested in as a child who, if someone had told me like, you should go into audio you should be an audio engineer. Like it would make sense now. Um, when I was over at Mecca's house last week, um, we were trying to find a good place for his microphone where it would be off screen when he's talking, but it would sound good. And the, we were only listening to it on his laptop speakers, right? So not great speakers. There was a moment when I could clearly tell there was reverb from the room and like a Mecca couldn't hear any of it. Like it was just it's me. Not, not and no, it's at just that moment, Jesse. It's a superpower. I, I, what I realized was like, they talk about having a trained ear and I'm like, Oh, I have that now. That was a skill. I self-taught myself and that made me feel really good. Like <laughs> I learned, I learned all these things over time, like not in the most healthy way possible, like always stressed on a deadline. Um, you know, I tell the story often, but when I had to switch editing programs, the only way I knew I was going to do it is if I forced myself to do an entire project in that new program and just Google any problem I ran into on how to do something. And it took forever, but that was the only way I was going to do it. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it slowly. I couldn't like read a, my dad always tells me to read manuals. I'm like, no one reads manuals. (laughs) Like we watch YouTube (laughs) videos, first of all. Yeah. Everyone watch. Hey. And even then we all skip through. Yeah. And then we all skip through the first four minutes of every YouTube video as the guy is telling you to subscribe to his channel, et cetera, um, (laughs) to get the, what you need. Um, But it was just like, I realized like I get to, Correct. Yeah, I get to, I get to learn things every day on this job, and that's what kept me sane this whole time. Um, I'm gonna tell you, he he had that playback, and again, we had like a bunch of different recordings, and on one particular one, he's like, "Yeah, you you, you hear that?" And I was like, uh, "Nope, it's negative. Don't hear <laughs> yeah. anything." And he's like, "Yep, <laughs> I hear my voice." And he's like, "All right, well, it's a little bit. I could tell it's different than this." And then we go back and play both of them, and I'm like, "Okay." So there is a difference, but I'm looking at me and it's clear as day for him. I'm like, mm-hmm. yo, I got a savant. I got a savant yeah. working with me right now. Jesse's given up on sending me uh, different snippets of recordings to say, oh, you know, ask me which sounds better or do you notice this? Because every time I'm like, maybe? <laughs> or, or I'll say, oh yeah, this one sounds better. And he's like, no, that was the wrong one. Yeah. That was the one I fixed. 
<laughs> at one point, he's fixing some settings. He's like, just trust me. Like, this, I'm like, bro, whatever you say, like, whatever, if this sounds, if it sounds good, because no matter what, no matter what sounds good to me, if it changing it sounds better to mm-hmm. you, it's already going to be better. I don't have a trained ear. I don't, I don't know what to listen yeah. for. So I'm like, yeah, like I, that's like an artist looking at my art and is like, well, actually it's not the same thing as artists because art is very mm-hmm. subjective. But I just, I just thought about a, a piece of art that I did that I thought was like bad. And I was like, if someone looks at it and says it's good, no, <laughs> my, it was great. Right. Uh, art can be good in the yeah, eye of the beholder. That's true. But you get what I'm saying. Like, yeah, to me, he's the expert. So the expert can listen to it. It'll be much better than expert saying something and validating something versus the lay person that has mm-hmm. no idea what I'm listening for, looking at. I, it's I, like I, if you were giving uh, some advice on public speaking, you know, because okay. oh, you're the, you're an expert yeah. on it. You know, that's a hard title. You know, I I know I threw that title out there, Jesse. I was like, oh, that's a hard title to kind of <laughs> kind of live up on. Yeah. Like, oh, you know, I am. I so I will say this: I am when people come up to me and ask me about speaking, or at least how to become a speaker. I definitely have a lot of different insight now because I've been through the process that I did not have. Just like you, Jesse, that kind of even all of the Googling of stuff, all of the, the YouTube videos, the, the mess ups, all of that is grist for the mill. It all goes into the person that we become and then are able to give that knowledge back to someone and help them make the fewer mistakes than we did. And that's ain't that why we do what we do. Mm-hmm. I will say our listeners won't know this because I spent a lot of time editing Pot for Good episodes anyway. But Omeka, I honestly don't think you've dropped more than three filler words this entire time. And that is from years of public speaking. And the reason why I don't do it is from years of editing myself and hearing myself. Um, and yeah, and you know, and you realize public speaking, especially when you have a speech written, how much human beings fill air with empty words and you're like i don't need to do this mm-hmm. to sound efficient it actually makes you sound less knowledgeable and less confident so it's, there is i was working with a guy he was a he was a coach uh, and he had told me that the word that is very unnecessary and so every time it has been mind blowing because every time i like will write something or go to say something and i use that I take it out and I think to myself, like, send it still works. Like, that is crazy. It is crazy. It's crazy. Like, it's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, like the, what's weird is, and I should have known this, someone, I think in college, one of my college professors told me that I write like a speech maker and not an essay writer. And I totally get that now. I write the same way I talk. And as an adult, that's actually been incredibly handy in school. Not so much, but <laughs> as, as someone yeah. who has to like talk to people about things now, you realize, Oh, this is, I'm writing in my own cadence with my own timing, which is why it's mostly commas and, you know, very long paragraphs. Have you written have, like, so when I look at presidents and having to give speeches and I know they use teleprompters and stuff, Basically, yeah, I, I, cause yeah, they, they've read, they've written through it, read through it, and then they have it on the teleprompter. It's still different reading words that you're going to say out loud than just being present and saying the words. Um, cause even when I try to write down any talk that I'm going to give, it's like that, I, that, that not, doesn't work. And one of the crazier, oh, this goes back to one of the, Chris, one of the question you asked earlier about like a speaking moment. I, was the MC for uh, one of the United Way's luncheon one year. Like it was a, it's a huge luncheon at the Cox Business Center. And again, you've got like 1,500 people in there. So they have me host or emceeing this entire thing. But I am like reading from a teleprompter that is at the very back <laughs> of the room, having to like announce all of these different names and all these different awards. And it was the most nerve-wracking public speaking thing that I've ever done because not only am I reading in front of everyone, geez, I'm reading in front of everyone. I'm like trying to get names and phonetic spellings, trying to keep up with the cadence of the prompter going up, uh, trying to make eye contact so it doesn't look like I'm reading. I was nervous 
but extremely proud after because it went, it went great. Like at the end of it, I was like, yo, I killed that <laughs> with the exception of a few words here and there. I was like, yo, I can't believe I got through that whole thing without like stumbling over. Obviously, <laughs> I, believe, I mean, um, can you go back? Like, I'm, I'm just glad I yeah. didn't do anything crazy like that. You know, it's one. Of, it's funny. One of the things I had to learn about public speaking is that generally speaking, nobody in the audience really knows what you're going to say. So if you forget to say something, nobody knows. Nope. You can just keep going. Very, you don't have to go true. back and try to fit it in. You could just keep talking and no one will ever know that you messed up. You will. You'll relive it in, you know, at night when you're trying to go to sleep, but nobody else will know. Yeah. I anxiety sometimes <laughs> will cause me to out myself. Like I wouldn't supposed to say that. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all know that I wouldn't just say that. Like I was reading to a I was reading to some kids and I felt so much pressure on reading this children's book on getting the words right. And literally that exact same thing you just said it was like someone's like, yo, these four or five year olds don't know what you're saying. Right yeah. anyway, yeah. so it's like oh, I have so much anxiety right now. I, <laughs> I mean, I stumbled yeah. over some books in the I, t- I tell people like, don't write your speech out. Write it in outline form because no matter what, people naturally want to keep editing, even while they're reading it. And I'm like, you're gonna flub over mm-hmm. changing a word, which is gonna throw off the cadence of the entire sentence. So instead, just outline the th- the the themes or specific things you want to mention, and let yourself fill in the rest of it. Because it's going to sound more natural and you're not going to make those weird, you know, like the page flipping problem where you're like, wait, what was my sense that I was yeah. just, just reciting now? Yeah. So, so I will tell you that one of my gifts, I would say, is being able to see things from different perspectives or um, not only that, but like using analogies. I use, I speak in analogies. Like, and I think that's something that I came, that came from my dad. Um, he's like an older, like Nigerian, they speak in Proverbs all the time. And I used to read Proverbs all the time in the Bible and stuff. So naturally, like I, I, I can naturally come up with different, um, analogies to make something mean, you know, to help someone understand a concept. What gets me in trouble sometimes is when I set down a path for an analogy and then kind of lose myself where I'm, where I'm going with it. Now, yeah. I would tell y'all when this is very evident for me, and it was very evident on the most public stage of my entire life. Now, I don't know if your audience knows, but audience, I have been on the Ellen show a couple of different times. And only you. And the later and only you. You were not accompanied by anybody else. (laughs) Shout out to Mike. (laughs) And on the on these latest, on the latest uh, uh, appearance. Me and Ellen, we, I was kind of, I was very nervous. I was very nervous. It's been a while since I'd been done anything live and a bunch of people are, and, but during the commercial break, her and I have a moment and I am trying to, when we come back from commercial, I am trying to communicate to her that she has planted a seed in my life. That seed has now grown and forever people will benefit from the fruit that it produces in my life. Now, as I'm here talking to you, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it makes sense Mm -hmm. to me. Planted seed, tree, fruit, what you've done for me will live on forever. Now, I am trying to say this on live TV, and I say something along the lines of like, I just want to say that the fruit, the seed that you've planted, produce fruit that people going to eat on and kind of lost my train of thought. and was like, um, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, thank you. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Most people don't know, like they, they, that moment doesn't even, doesn't even like come up or it's like, they don't, they, they, not, they don't really see that moment. I, every time I see that recording, that's all <laughs> I think about is like, yep. When trying to keep it real goes wrong, I tried to try to come up with something on the fly. <laughs> <laughs> did, did not land the way I wanted to land. Like landed, landed, but it wasn't without any like. Yeah, you know, I mean, like talk show, talk show guest public speaking is a whole. I feel like a whole other like master's degree you would have to get because you have that like five minutes or whatever, and you got to hit your points. And they're you know the person you're talking to is literally an expert at this, and probably only half listening to you 
And <laughs> you, I've no, the, I learned so much about the how the show goes with like even the note cards because you're just queuing up your interviewer like so they can yeah. so they can talk. So it, she got bullet points. Bullet points. Bullet points are your best friend. Is all I'm saying. <laughs> there you go. So well, Omeka, this has been great. I'm sorry it took us so long to have you on the podcast, but you know, you're busy. Timing is it's true. It's perfect. And um, but real quickly before before we let you go, um, just tell our audience like what you're doing next, like where where maybe they can see you, how they can follow you, etc. All right. Um, everyone, you can follow me on all things social media at Ameka Naka. Um, that is my handle as Instagram. Um, my website also is amekanaka.com. You can also get there by going to livebeyondlabels.com. That is livebeyondlabels.com. Um, what's next for me? Um, I am currently studying to get my, uh, I need to take my counseling exam so that I can uh, finish up my license stuff. Um, I'll be doing more you know, counseling part-time and stuff, but speaking, uh, I will be in Oklahoma city on Wednesday. Um, and I don't know when people are going to hear this, but I've got a couple of speaking engagements coming up that are going to take me to different parts of Oklahoma. Um, in November, I'm going out to Bridgeport, Connecticut, um, for a hope conference there where I'll get to meet a bunch of different kids that, um, have kind of heard my story through their curriculum. And so I'm really excited about that. That's the thing that I'm excited about most right now is because you have to go back to the East Coast. I'm going to spend, spend a day in New York City just kind of taking in some sites. Um, but yeah, you'll be able to see some stuff on my Instagram about that. Very cool. Well, uh, thank you, Chris. Do you have anything else you, you want to say before we wrap it up? Now you're just putting me on the spot. And you're welcome. I think uh, the seed you've planted in today's podcast will grow into a tree and the fruit <laughs> Sorry. Good job. Good job. <laughs> Almost got there. Almost got All there. All right. Well, on that note, <laughs> thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you all for listening to our episode with Emeka. Please follow Pod for Good on all the social media channels. I know we don't post as much as I would like, and that's on me, but please uh, make sure to like Pod for Good on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. I think I actually sent a TikTok out at some point uh, over the last couple weeks, so you can all look for that. And of course, please subscribe. And I swear, no one listens to this because we say every time that if you leave a review, we will read it on air. As far as I know, Apple's not notified me of any new reviews. So if you have reviewed it and we've missed it, please send me a message on Facebook and we will read it on this next episode. But as always, Broken Arrow, get your shit together. Tulsa, get it done. Stay safe out there. Nailed it. <laughs>